Tom here from Lawrence Systems, and we're going to talk about IoT security. Now, people lump a lot of things in IoT. Um, that makes these headlines way more fun to read, of course, because then it makes the attacks look bigger, and bigger attacks and doom and gloom is something the news wants to sell you on. And let's talk about, we're going to break down this versus the reality of security. Now, if you're interested in needing help with your network, uh, whether it be IoT security or other projects, head over to lawrencesystems.com. There's a Hire Us button, and you can learn more about the hiring process and having us help secure your network. Now, Hacking Nemo, an adversary compromises smart fish tank at Casino. I love the headline. This is from a couple of years ago, and there was a fish tank that had Wi-Fi that, well, it had some flaws, and they attached it to their corporate network, which is a horrible idea, because once someone pivoted off the fish tank, uh, they were able to fish around and find all kinds of fun things on their network. And frequently, companies leave things open on their network, so once you're inside or behind the firewall, lateral movement becomes a lot easier. Well, that being said, it's probably not a good idea to attach a smart fish tank to your corporate network. Same with this. IoT worm can hack Philips Hue light bulbs and spread across cities. Easy chain reaction hack would spread across Paris. Well, back to the same problem of it's a great headline from 2016, and here we are in 2020, and I have not seen the apocalypse of flashing light bulbs that we thought we would see. But hey, once again, a good headline. Now, there are real risks, and I've done a video on proxy chains and a Red Teamer's Guide to Pivoting, and uh, they talk about how to, once you get into a device that has been pushed through the firewall and has access to it, you can then pivot and get inside of a network. And these are the things we want to prevent. So let's go and look at how these systems are being attacked. Telnet, SMB, and SSH, uh, Microsoft SQL, and MySQL ports. And I bring this up, and I'll leave links to all these too so you can do some further reading on it. Um, one of the things is this is all stuff that got them through the firewall. This is why you want to put it on a separate network or have a good firewall. We're going to get to that in a, just a second here. And second part is IoT. The reason you see the numbers bigger than they are in terms of, and I say as they are, is I don't necessarily think routers should necessarily, it would, would be listed in IoT devices, but they are. Cameras, maybe, but routers, they're routers, so your firewalls. And the biggest piece of all these, you know, Mirai botnet and many of the other botnets out there that are variants thereof of Mirai and all these attacks are because consumer routers are poorly made, were poorly made for a long time without security in mind, never get updated. Therefore, they are the method of attack all the time. And right there, when they point this out, retroactively looking at effective devices, service banners, internet world scanning, reviews most of the devices appear to be routers and cameras reported by a short about, and they are. So a lot of people will start really worrying about all their IT devices, but they're not as likely to be attacked when they're not directly attached to the internet, with the exception of the routers, which if you have a good router, then you're a lot better off. And uh, I have a couple of videos on this topic, and we're going to break this down. I do have, and this is going to go a lot more in depth and, than this video will, but this is the detail of how to. I'm going to talk a lot about the philosophy here. PF sense and rules for IoT devices with MDNS. That's what this is right here. I have this video where it breaks it all down, how to set up the rules, how to put things on a separate network and talk to them. Then to go a step further, maybe you have an office network. This is a little bit more expensive, but an office network design and planning with VLANs, LODP rules, IoT, and guests using Unify and PFSense. I break down all of those details on there. Now, these are two complete guides and setups, and you can see there's, they're a little bit longer, but we're going to talk about what goes where, because this is the one part where people start asking the question of what goes on what side of the network. And I'm starting this simple, but you could add more networks as needed. So IoT devices, with the exception of routers. So I'm going to make some assumptions here that you have PFSense or some other router that's not one of the uh, really inexpensive big box store consumer brand ones that are easy to buy. I don't know how else to define them because I can't say like it's a Cisco because yes, those old Cisco's, they made some consumer ones and they made commercial ones. And if you have one of these consumer based routers, such as the D-Link or Netgears, they frequently have security holes that never get patched. And if they do get patched, people don't load the patches. So I'm going to point out specifically, instead of trying to say it fuzzily, PFSense is a solid commercial router solution. It is both open source and a big favorite of mine. Other runners up, and I've done videos on them, is you could do this as well with something like Untangle, another really good option. I also point out in this particular design, I'm using Unify switch, but really any type of switch or multiple switches would work. We're really going to focus on the concepts here. Those other videos break down some of the more technical details in there. But when it comes to concepts, Right here, we have this network with full access to local internet. And this is more like a guest network. It's um, 
separated. It is internet only, no local access, as in these devices can't talk to these devices, but these devices can talk to these devices. And that's usually adequate for separating the devices. But the next question is, well, what devices belong over here? Cell phones, I actually prefer over on this network. Now your cell phone was generally designed, whether you have an Android or iOS, Apple device, both of those are devices designed to be on what I would consider hostile networks. They generally provided you're running them stock, don't have open services on them for someone to attack them. They're made to go on public Wi-Fi and, you know, and deal with that type of environment. And your streaming devices, such as a Chromecast or a list of other devices, you want to usually use those from the phone. You want to play your music or play a video uh, on watch it on the Chromecast. In your refrigerator, that can be on there too. Now, having them all on the same network, and I say like a guest network, but you don't want to do isolation policies because, well, that will come out, cause an immediate problem of if you isolate devices on a guest network, a lot of buttons that you check to say isolation, what that means is that stops the devices from laterally talking to each other. Maybe you want that on a guest network because you don't want the guest network to see other guests. But when it comes to setting up IoT devices, if I want my phone to talk to my Chromecast, on the same network works. Now, one of the other videos I mentioned, there are tools so you can have devices on this network and through a tool called MDNS, talk to this network, but it is one of those things that you'll find is a little bit buggy and not everything supports it. So phones, your Amazon Dots or Google Homes or all these. And like I said, this is all about uh, security, not privacy. That's a whole separate topic of what you think of having these devices or a fridge that listens to you um, is, is a whole different topic. But Keeping them all on one network is fine because if any of these devices gets compromised in any way, they're going to look for lateral movement. Are they likely from lateral movement to then infect the Chromecast? Not likely. Could someone possibly hack the fridge and then broadcast them to your Chromecast? That is a possibility. Um, and there was a event uh, perpetrated by the, well, the person named themselves the hacker giraffe that did compromise a bunch of Chromecasts, uh, not through this methodology, but through the fact that they opened things through universal plug and play. And we're able to broadcast uh, things randomly to the network uh, and on your Chromecast. So it's not an unheard of possibility, but in general, it's not where your security problem. So uh, other than the, the potential for these devices to, if they have some type of port open or are insecure, they're all on the same network. Now, if you wanted to really break it down and put every one of them on their own network, you could do that too. But each of these devices reaches out to the internet and comes back with the data. They're all talking to the cloud server that they belong to. So they don't actually need to talk over here. Now, what about printers? Aren't they an IoT device? Well, sure. Anything, I guess, you could call an IoT device, but printers, because we have our workstations and laptops over here on this network, and this is a network where we're getting business done, you throw your printers over here. Now, could you throw them over here? Yes. Will you have problems? Maybe. Depends on the driver of the printer. You have some printers that work really well being on a separate network. You have other printers that just don't. They don't like being on separated networks. The people who wrote the drivers of a printer didn't expect them to have separation. Now, when you get into the commercial printers, like your Xerox copy centers and your Kyoceras and Ricos and your large copiers, they, sim they simply don't ever really seem to have a problem being on a separate network. We set those up when clients request, and they're made to be on like a routed network, and that's not a big deal. But a lot of the consumer ones, whether they're wireless or wired, putting them on a separate network creates immediate problems with the drivers not being able to communicate with them. Now, this is not true for every printer. Someone's going to point out, but I have this printer and it works. Great. If you have an exhaustive list of which ones do and don't, cool, I don't. Uh, and this is one of those problems we run into when people contract us for consulting is they've stuck the printer on the other network and the drivers aren't supported and they want us to sort it out. And I'm like, there's not a really sorting out problem. It's got to go on this network. And I'm like, but isn't my printer an attack vector? Statistically unlikely. Um, for someone to get into your printer, one, we're assuming you've not opened the firewall up to talk to the printer. That would be the first thing you don't want to do. And because by default with PFSense, the firewall does not allow things to come through and UPnP is off by default in PFSense, unless you have done something to insecure the system, the printers may or may not need access to the internet and you could write a rule to block their access because, well, the only thing you really need is to go from one computer to that printer, from this computer to this printer, but the printer itself does not need to get out to the internet. So you could, if you're really worried about it, write rules to block access to there. But I've looked, a lot of printers don't seem to ever call out to the internet unless they have some firmware or driver updates that they do that, that they need. 
Um, but it's not as often. A lot of times that is all facilitated by the driver you're loading on your computer that speaks to the printer and it is what pushes those things. And if you're truly worried about it, get, and I know they're harder to find now actually, um, USB printers. I've, I went and looked, I noticed a lot of the consumer ones don't always even have USB. They're kind of expecting them to be wireless now. Um, I don't know a lot about printers because we still use old HP printers because they work even though they're like 15 years old, which once again, I do know there's some security flaws potentially in those printers because of their age but I don't really worry about it. And why do I say that, you know, being a security guy, because we don't even have internet access on those printers. They're kind of locked down and someone would have to get in our network. And the worst thing they would do because there's passwords between my servers and my computers and everything else is they would be able to maybe scan the network with a really old slow controller that's in here and it doesn't have routing in it. So you can't really go anywhere else, but this partial network. Uh, and you would have to figure out a way to get inside my network first for these devices to even start doing that. And the reality is, and this is something a lot of people overlook. Well, couldn't they attack this? Well, if they're already in my network, they're probably going to use whatever tool got them in my network to provide better, faster scanning and more effective scanning. So my first goal is to keep them on this side of the firewall, because once you're on this side, the printer is the least of my worries. This is a slow device. Any device they have is probably not as old as the printer. And if they're on this side of the network, lateral movement is going to be facilitated by whatever device they either compromised or added to this side of the network. This is one of those security thinking things people need to do of they asked me about certain attacks. I'm like, that's the, once it's like, oh, couldn't someone plug this in an attack? I'm like, once they have physical access to your building, there's a lot of different things you need to be concerned about. Um, it's not likely they're going to go put a dropper on an old printer. They're more likely because of speed to attack it in some other way. So printers, I do let live on this network. Now, a couple of things I'll throw in. I do cover this in my more extensive office setup video. One of those videos I'll leave links to below is, for example, if you have phones uh, using things like LLDP, awesome. You can build your own uh, separated network for phones very easily and have it pass through or putting them on a separate network. Now, phones, once again, kind of the same. They may, depending on who you use for internet, who you use for VoIP, they may need to reach out to the internet to talk to a server. But I'll often, like in our case, for example, our free PBX server is local, so they only need to be on the same network as our free PBX server um, to talk to that. So you can kind of make your own determination. And having on a separate network is not a bad deal at all. Uh, that way, all that traffic is over there, and you can put special quality controls on it if need be because, well, you want phones... Phones don't need necessarily speed, but they need low latency. So you may want to set priorities on that. That would be a separate topic. Lastly, cameras. What about these cameras? Aren't that a big part of the Mirai botnet? Yes, but the problem with the cameras is not actually usually the cameras getting hacked. It's the NVR system itself. And people like to punch a hole through their firewall and expose it. Don't put that thing on this network. Don't put it on your uh, network you use here, which is the, um, in this case, the 192.168.3 network. That would be bad. Uh, putting it over here is a better idea, but trust me, if you are using one of those off-branded, uh, and, and once again, it's hard to define these, but there's a lot of these companies that make these inexpensive uh, NVR recorders that are poorly done. They sell them at a lot of the big box stores. They don't get security updates or patches. They're frequently um, wide open with admin and 12346 as their default password and no one ever changes. And even when you do change it, they're they were written so many years ago and have so many security flaws and they frequently get infected. While I don't recommend opening these crappy things to the internet, people still do. Those at least should be over here on a separate network. Or if you want to create a separate complete network for all the cameras, just so they're over somewhere else, that's perfectly fine too. Um, the cameras themselves are less a worry. You can block them from the internet because generally they don't need it, but they do need to reach out to a time server and you can usually set something local, for example, in Unify, because one, something that's important for a lot of the cameras is to do time synchronization. So they do look for that. So this is kind of a breakdown of where to put some of those things and some thoughts on design of it. For the more technical aspects, I'll link to those other videos where you can dive deeper into like the functional, how I did it with PFSense and Unify and how I set the VLANs up, et cetera. But from a concept standpoint and a security standpoint, this is the IoT, which by the way, if you don't have other things in place for security, like a password manager and all that, do those first because a lot of people focus on this IoT and the reality is they click a phishing link and that's what gets them pwned. They open up a bad link in a browser that's not been patched from an unpatched system, that gets them pwned. This is actually lower down the list despite it having great headlines in terms of everyone really excited about IoT and it being the death of the internet and the, the uh, massive lights blinking everywhere and 
uh, you know, all the fun things that we have with, you know, hacking things on here. But in the reality of what I deal with in security and doing incident response and follow up, this is rarely this is it, it takes some hunting to find that the IoT devices almost every time it's been phishing emails and other security practices from unpatched systems or people just opening up firewalls from their default, opening them up and opening up a bunch of these devices. That's where we see more problems, not from, oh, my gosh, my Amazon dot completely is what compromised the network. Mostly that's going to have a, a privacy problem more so than a security problem with those devices. All right. And thanks. And thank you for making it to the end of the video. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you'd like to see more content from the channel, hit the subscribe button and hit the bell icon if you like YouTube to notify you when new videos come out. If you'd like to hire us, head over to lawrencesystems.com, fill out our contact page, and let us know what we can help you with and what projects you'd like us to work together on. If you want to carry on the discussion, head over to forums.lawrencesystems.com where we can carry on the discussion about this video, other videos, or other tech topics in general, even suggestions for new videos. They're accepted right there on our forums, which are free. Also, if you'd like to help the channel out in other ways, head over to our affiliate page. We have a lot of great tech offers for you. And once again, thanks for watching and see you next time.